I'm here. Huh. Ah, I gotta change the view on this. Uh, there, now I can come right over here. Now I can see it. So, okie doke. So, this lecture is on telescopes. So, the last time we talked about um, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, so we talked about the information that we collect. Um, to observe the universe. Now we're going to talk about the instruments that we use to collect that information. And those are all referred to as telescopes. So this is just our instrument to collect radiation. Now, for the longest time, uh, for most of the times we had telescopes, we've only had two types of telescopes because of the Earth's atmosphere. As I said before, the Earth's atmosphere blocks out almost all the radiation except for radio waves and visible light. And so on Earth, what we have um, on Earth, we have just visible light. Visible light and we have radio telescopes. Now, space, you can have ball, because there's nothing blocking it. So we do have gamma ray telescopes, uh, X-ray, uh, microwave, infrared, uh, ultraviolet, the whole gamut, radio waves, the whole thing. And space telescopes, best place to put them. Um, but it's more expensive because you got to put them up into space. Okay, so let's talk about telescope design. So there are um, three, so if you're going to make a, 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 a telescope, so there are three important aspects to a telescope. Okay. Nope. Nope. There are three important aspects to a telescope. So if you're considering making a telescope, these are the three things you want to consider when you do your telescope. So the first one, something called magnifying power. And magnifying power refers to how big the object appears. So this is how large object appears. And for early telescopes, this was important because the optics weren't very good. So you, you couldn't get um, a real detailed picture. So if you could make it bigger, you, you could see better. And this is based on focal length. Now, what is that? Well, let's take a look. Here, I got pictures. Here is a typical um, glass refracting telescope. So the focal length refers to the distance from the one lens to where it's focused here. And actually, it's right here to the focus length. This is going just a little beyond. Um, the longer that focal length is, the bigger the image is going to appear. And you guys all know this. If you've taken a, a magnifying glass, you hold it close to your eye, you move it away, the image gets bigger. Well, you're stretching it because you're making that focal length in, in bigger. And you probably notice it doesn't necessarily make it clear, it just makes the image bigger. Um, so, now, for here, the, this 
with having two lenses, if you had just one lens, this would be the, the equivalent of having a magnifying glass. But with an eyepiece, you've got your focal image. So this is where the image comes clear. Now it actually reverses so that the eyepiece turns the turns the image back. It's a little more complicated. We don't need to get into the optics of it. Um, but basically here you you're this lens will then put the, the light beams back in parallel as opposed to having them at an angle. Because if you're focusing right here, they're still kind of coming at an angle and you want to bring them back to uh, parallel like they, they started um, in the beginning. So you get it doesn't distort. Like if you use a magnifying glass, you might notice that the image kind of looks warped and distorted because the, the light is coming in uh, slightly differently. So, but that just makes it uh, appear bigger. Now, before you could make the lenses really big, um, this became so important, there was like an arms race with making these telescopes super long because then this made the image look really big. Now, not more detailed, but bigger. And so before they could make the, the lenses bigger, we'll get to that in a minute, so. Okay, so back we go. Okay, so the the longer the telescope, the bigger the image is going to appear. So the second is light gathering power. And this is basically just how many photons can you collect? And this is going to give you more detail. The more photons I can collect, the more detail. I mean, think about pixels on your TV screen or whatever. The more pixels you have, the more tiny little dots, the clearer your image is going to appear. So um, if I can, and this is based on the diameter. Based on lens diameter. So. A little one is not going to collect as much many photons as a bigger one is. So the wider my telescope is, the more photons I can collect, the more detailed my image is. Now, if you think about this, what's more important than, if I compare these two, what's more important, the light gathering power or the magnifying power? Well, with today's computers, being able to take an image and blow it up for me, light gathering power. I can always put it into a computer and expand or, or that picture as much as I want. But if I just make the picture bigger without more detail, it's just going to look grainy. So it's like walking up close to a bad TV. You're just going to get a bunch of dots. Light gathering power, the more detail I have in it, I do, it can be short because I can put it into a computer and blow it up as much as I want. The last one then is something called resolving power. And resolving power is it's, it's based on how close I can have two objects to each other and they appear like two. So that would be good. Bad would be if it looks something like this. So that's uh, good. That would be bad. So really bad was if it just kind of looks like that. So, so it's how clear the image is. And this is based on optics. Now, what astronomers have found is that, sorry, I keep walking out of the picture. Uh, what astronomers have found is that with Earth-based telescopes, there's only so good your optics need to be because the atmosphere acts like a filter and it distorts the image. So you could have super good optics but the atmosphere is going to make the image blurry, uh, blurry, and so it doesn't matter. And so ground-based, it's not as important. Space-based, super important, because there's nothing that's going to disturb your image. So you, can, you want to have the best possible optics when you go out into space. On land, there is a limit. 
it's kind of like me and good uh, uh, good headphones. I, I don't need good headphones anymore. My hearing's so bad that if you give me the best ones, I don't notice it from you know ten dollar versions of stuff. And it's just not going to matter. My hearing is not that good anymore. So, so those are the three things. What, so, what are the two important? Resolving power and light gathering power way more important than magnifying power because magnifying power now can be replaced by computers. You just expand the image up. But before you had really good optics, magnifying power was important. So the optics couldn't, you couldn't get the detail in it, but you could blow the image up so that you could look. Hence why we had the, you know, that giant telescope before. So those are what you consider in it. Now, there are two types of, of visible light telescope. So, and as I said, there's type one is refracting. And type two is reflecting. Reflecting, this uses a refracting, uses a glass lens. And this uses mirrors. Okay, so, all modern telescopes are reflecting telescopes. They use mirrors. We no longer use refracting telescopes. Refracting telescopes have a couple of problems. Uh, one, the light is going through the lens and that, pla and that glass lens will then distort the image. Uh, it actually acts like a prism and breaks it apart. And then if you have any impurities in it, it's blocking the light. So this glass lens distorts the image The other problem is it's, it's difficult to make large. So if I want to make a 10 foot diameter glass lens, that's near impossible. And you got to think about how hard it would be to mount that. I've got to hold that on the edge and all that weight is out at the end of the telescope. So that's going to be very heavy, very hard construction to make. So it's hard to make those glass lenses to, to grind those perfectly and then hold them. So these are really hard to manufacture. So it distorts the image. It's difficult to make large. It's hard to mount. So don't use these anymore. So the benefit of mirrors, it doesn't distort the image. And we come over here. So as that goes through here, it's distorting the image as it goes through. It also has to be, as I said, be held on the edges, which makes that difficult if you can only hold it on the edge. And then the glass itself, if I'm going to aim it up, it's going to become brittle. It's going to be hard then to make large so it might crack. Okay, now going to reflecting telescopes. The good thing about this well, there's a couple of good things. One is it's not going to distort the image. It's just reflecting the image. And you can make mirrors. It's only one sided. So I can hold them on the back. And the mirror is actually at the end of the, the bottom of the telescope. And so that makes it easy to mount. The weight isn't up at the top. It's down at the bottom. And you can make these in pieces. It doesn't have to be one. So if you look at the, the web, Let's see if I've got a picture. Should. Yeah. So looking at the web, this is actually a set of mirrors. This is what they're, and I'm so excited that this is going to come up with its new, the, the first image is really, really soon. But it's made of, of, of a bunch of mirrors that they put together. Now they have to line them after a while, but you can make it in pieces. So it's easier to manufacture, it's easier to mount, and it doesn't distort the light. There's a couple of different designs. A prime one has your, your collection here. The problem with that is you have to put all your instrumentation here right in the middle. So you're more often gonna use something like a Newtonian where this is set at a 45 degree angle to bounce the light out the side, or a Cassin grain where you put it right out the back. Now this, is easy because right on the back here you can put all your instrument packages to collect the the image 
And so I would say more of the modern telescopes are cast and grain design because it goes right back to where you can mount all the instruments necessary to collect those photons. Now, yes, there is a little bit of blockage of light from this mirror in the center and then of the, the pieces that hold it, which, oh, I can show you uh, the telescope we have, but that is kind of a minimal uh, issue. So let me swing that by. So if you look at, at, at this telescope, you can see that there are the, the support structures in there. And yeah, you get a, a little bit of, of distortion from that. And then this one, because it's so small, you can see the secondary mirror is rather large. So there's kind of a large blockage from this. But if this were a much larger telescope, that would be less of, a, of an impact on that. So, okay. Darn it. And I broke the cover off. Yeah, it's good. Don't tell. That, no, not that way. Okay, so this reflect or reflects. Flex image. This is easy to make. They mount. And this is why this is what all modern telescopes are now made of. Um. Okay, radio telescopes. Radio telescopes have kind of fallen out of fashion on Earth. Um, Uh, basically because what they're collecting is um, very, so radio waves are low energy, they're created by colder objects. And so for radio waves, because they're low energy, radio telescopes have to be huge to collect enough photons to get any sort of a picture of what you're looking at. And so uh, radio waves, low energy, so radio telescopes need to be huge. Okay, now, and the problem is that the images are low resolution, so low detail. But there is an importance to using radio telescopes on Earth um, because radio waves uh, can actually travel through clouds that would block other types of radiation. Um, we can also uh, look at, at, at objects that visible light wouldn't. So they do have their, their usage. The problem is that they're very expensive to make, and so they're not going to make any more. They're just going to kind of keep the few that they have. The money is better spent with sending telescopes into space. And that's really where you want to put a telescope is in space because you don't have the limitations of, of being on Earth. So um, radio telescopes can be used in a series like you can you can sling a bunch of radio telescopes together to actually make it appear like a, a bigger telescope. It's kind of complicated, but basically by collecting it at different points, you and all aiming at the same thing, you're collecting more photons to get a, a better picture of, of what you're looking at. So, um, so that is one benefit of having, say, more radio telescopes, is, but they're not as, they're not as popular. So, where to place a telescope? 
So you want to put a telescope somewhere. You built one where you want to put it. The absolute best place, as I said, is in space because there's going to be absolutely no uh, limitations. You can put it out in space. Um, there's no, nothing filtering. But now, where else would you want to put a telescope? So now it's on Earth. So where on Earth would you put a telescope? Well, first off, a bad place to put the telescope would be right at the pole. Why? Well, you're only going to be able to see half the universe. Where would you like to put it? Put your telescope at the equator. That way you can see both up, down, and all around. So anywhere near the equator is better because you get a better field of view of the entire world. Now, where else would you like to put it? Well, away from any cities because it's away from, from less light pollution, but ideally on top of a mountain at the equator. That would be a great place. Why on a mountain? Higher you go, the less atmosphere, higher you go, the less atmosphere you have to look through. And so actually, it, yeah, so there's less filtering. So the higher up, less filtering, the better your image is going to be. So next would be the equator. And on a mountain. So you want to get the best, you want to get the best view possible and the least distortion from the atmosphere. And so that's where you want to put telescopes. So um, let's go take a look at what pictures I have. Okay, I think that this is the Keck Observatory, and I believe this one is in Hawaii. What's kind of cool is you can see down into uh, the telescope. What you can see is, again, the telescope is really wide, but not really long. And again, long doesn't matter as much as the wide as I can gather up uh, more light. And it's up on a mountain. Look at all the clouds and whatnot that are below it. Uh, I believe this is, I, I believe that was the telescope, Keck, over here. Um, and so this is up on the summit of Mount Maloa in Hawaii. I don't remember what that one is. But you can see there's quite a number of uh, telescopes already up there. Oh, and by the way, this is Subaru. And Subaru happens to be the Japanese name for the constellation we call Pleiades. And if you look on the front of a Subaru car, They've got the constellation. That's what the pattern is for the Subaru um, car brand. So um, anyway, so those are up on a mountain. Now, this is, and I believe this has already been um, decommissioned, but this is the telescope in West Virginia, not too far away from it. It's in green. Oh, uh, green something. I can't remember. I, I'm not green belts in Maryland. That's not it. Uh, green something. But anyway, you can get an idea about how huge uh, this is. That That's a regular, like, six-foot or eight-foot uh, fence that surrounds this. It's an absolutely huge uh, green bow. You know, that. It'll come to me later after I stop recording. Um, but that was a radio telescope put in West Virginia, again, up on a mountain. This is, was the Arecibo uh, telescope in Puerto Rico. Unfortunately, last year, the year before, the cable supporting this focus point broke and it fell in and destroyed the, the telescope. And there are no longer plans or not plans to fix this. What was interesting about this telescope was instead of rotating the dish, they moved the collection point. Now. Because of the way it was curved, um, the, this is a, a hyperbolic curve. So when it, things hit it, it all bounces to one focus point. The other interesting thing about a, 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 a parabolic, I think it's parabolic, excuse me, curve, is that if you straight above 
everything will bounce to the middle at a point. But if you move the collection point over, then it collects it from the direction it goes. Anyway, you can, so you've got your curve. If you move the collection point, then you're collecting from where you moved it. So if I move it down here, I'm collecting things that, that all bounce and hit to that collection point. So it is a, an interesting thing that you can either move the dish or you can move the collection point. Uh, this is, I think, the very large array in New Mexico. So they're using all these dishes in an array to, to make it uh, act like a much bigger one. So these are showing some telescopes and they're, they've shown them about where they are. So these are visible light telescopes on Earth. So microwave and radio wave telescopes on Earth. We have an infrared in an airplane that flies up out of the atmosphere to try to collect some of the infrared before it's filtered out. And then out in space, we have gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet, visible light, there's the Hubble, and then some in the microwave and radio range. Uh, but it's way better to have those things out in space. And there is the infrared telescope on the NASA airplane. Um, and I think that can fly high enough that it gets through half of our atmosphere. Below three and a half miles is, is um, uh, most uh, half of our atmosphere, so if it gets up above that, so it's half the filtering. This is a picture, it's called the Hubble uh, deep field picture, but this was looking at uh, a point in the sky, I think about the size of your fingernail if you held it out on your on your thumb, like that up in the sky, that was completely black, and then the Hubble Space Telescope looked at it, and everything you're seeing, save this one point here, those are all galaxies. And here's another one, which they did the same thing. Oh, and this, this is the new James Webb Space Telescope, which is out at a Lagrange point, which is a point of equal gravity. So it's a point at which the gravity from the Earth and the Sun are equal, and so it's not going to move. And they parked it there so it doesn't move. Um, and it is just about ready to go. The the way what this is is the shield from the Sun. So the Sun would be, it's actually would be sideways. The Sun would be down here, shining, and this blocks the Sun from heating up the, the telescope. It blocks it. So that the telescope can then aim and look where it wants. And this is the Hubble. By comparison, the the uh, mirror on this is 6.5 meters, or what's that, about 20 feet? And this was only about 8 feet. And there's a picture showing how they folded it all up and stuck it in the, the area the rocket. So, and uh, pulled it up. Very, very ingenious design to, to, to be able to fold that all up. And, and there's a picture of the uh, mirrors when they were assembled. Okay, that was a short lecture. I could have tacked it on the other one, but uh, and I just made it its own. So, I will then end this. Bye!